the WebEx link that was shared with you in recent emails and mute your phone. I believe that we have a global mute function on, but just in case not, go ahead and mute your phones, please. Sounds like everybody has. We are going to start with Dr. David Gutzler, who is a professor of meteorology and climatology at the University of New Mexico. His research is based on analysis of observations and climate models with the goals of understanding the causes of climate variability and change and improving the skills and application of forecasts on seasonal and longer time scales. After uh, Dr. Gutzler's presentation, which will last about 20 minutes, we will have um, a couple of additional speakers, and then following that, we will take questions. So if you have questions, please wait till the end of the second presentation, and at that time, we will unmute your phones. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gutzler. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'll spend 20 or so minutes uh, describing some research uh, that I've done, um, most of which was done in collaboration with a grad student named Shailene Chavarria, and so I want to acknowledge her. She now works for USGS at the New Mexico Water Science Center. Both of our presentations uh, here today will be focused on um, processes that modulate stream flow up in the uh, headwaters of the Rio Grande. And so I'll start just by looking at this map that's in the upper left of the uh, slide on the screen. Um, so uh, the large scale context here is that the Rio Grande starts in southern Colorado, has its headwaters there and flows southward through the black and gray regions on that map. The black regions are where the flow is generally snowmelt dominated, and that snowmelt uh, runoff signature extends down to southern New Mexico where there's a big reservoir uh, that essentially resets the flow because the outflow from that reservoir called Elephant Butte uh, is very highly regulated and um, uh, serves the needs of, of users downstream. Uh, we'll be focused in the upper part of this basin um, where uh, if I blow that up and, and, and add a map uh, looking just at the region in southern Colorado, uh, this, these presentations today will be focused on processes happening uh, up there, and in particular, uh, I'll be talking about uh, flow at a gauge called Del Norte uh, on the upper Rio Grande, uh, which, as you can see from the map, is located uh, where the uh, the Rio Grande opens up into the San Luis Valley. So up above the Del Norte gauge, the flows are very heavily snowmelt driven and there's little enough um, uh, uh, human activity in the form of dams and diversions that we can use the gauged flows and interpret them in terms of natural processes. So my presentation will focus on um, the, the, basically in the yellow box are my conclusions. Um, we'll show hey Dave, you, uh, uh, hello? Dave, yeah, sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure you're sharing your screen or at least we can't see it here. Oops, um, and I'm not sure what to do about that. If my, um, I'm told that my screen is not being shared. There should be a button. If you look at the top center, it should say share screen. Sorry, we skipped a step. Yep, user error at this end. Okay, we've got you now, thank you. Great, thanks for the interruption. Oh. Uh, Okay, there's the mystery map up in the upper left that I was talking about. And so um, this black region up here is generally snowmelt dominated. As we get farther downriver, uh, the, the snow, um, the, the amount of snow decreases and, and a different set of processes uh, comes into play that determines stream flow. So, as I said before, we'll be looking today 
principally up here in the upstream end, and there's a map here of the uh, headwaters of the Rio Grande in southern Colorado uh, with a big green triangle for the location of the Del Norte gauge, which is the principal focus of my presentation. And we'll be hearing more about snow pack processes from uh, David Clow in a few minutes and, and his colleagues. Um, so, so my conclusions are going to be that I'll try to show you that in this region, um, temperature has been rising and snowpack has been decreasing at a pretty rapid clip uh, for several decades already. However, the scientific conundrum here is that um, as that happens, we see only very modest observed long-term trends in streamflow volume. Um, in fact, they're not statistically significant. and um, I will try to show you that we think that that's happening as a consequence of snow turning to rain in combination with natural variability of precipitation on decadal time scales. And we combine that, and I'll say a few words about point three, um, which is relating how these changes in hydrologic processes up in the headwaters have been working to degrade the quality of uh, seasonal water supply outlooks over the last several decades. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> okay, to motivate this, I just wanted to show you very quickly what climate models are forecasting for this region, which is part of the reason we're so interested in, in what's going on up in the headwaters. And that's simply that all climate models project rapid temperature increase over the course of the 21st century. And a consequence of that is that a whole family of different kinds of uh, uh, streamflow models, surface hydrology models, have projected that streamflow in the upper Rio Grande should diminish overall, as shown by this hydrograph on the right, um, and that the snowmelt runoff peak which is currently uh, here in May, shown by the black line, should push uh, weeks earlier to uh, an, an earlier peak um, as the snow that remains melts earlier. So it's not shown explicitly on this figure, but the, the big changes we see both across the southwest and the major river basins, such as the Colorado and the Rio Grande, and in this hydrograph on the right, are due to diminished and earlier snowmelt runoff. Those are based on models. So what I will uh, talk about here are observations. Uh, and then first, by way of background about snowpack, here is a, a slide showing what we see uh, in the mountains of southern Colorado uh, for snow accumulation and ablation uh, in the historical record. And, and the point of this, uh, of these two graphs here, is to show you that the average uh, snow water equivalent curve over the course of a water year, shown in black, it's the same curve in both panels, uh, tends to peak right about April 1st, and that is the canonical peak snowmelt date in the um, southern Rocky Mountains. Um, but in addition to an average peak on April 1st, what we see is that if we um, average a bunch of above average snowpack years, so uh, 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 that is to say the curve on the right shows a bunch of years that all have above average snow uh, water equivalent on April 1st. And the curve on the right shows um, a, a bunch of years where there was below average snow on April 1st. And, and the point is to show that almost all the above average years exhibit above average snow accumulation even well before April 1st. So we get predictive value even early in the calendar year by looking at the observed snowpack um, in the, the southern Rocky Mountains. Um, and I should say that these curves are all based on a single snow tail site, so the confidence we have in, in above average snowpack is increased if we're actually looking at an average of, of sites. <laughs> on the right, we see that almost all the years in which there was below average snow on April 1st also exhibited below average snow well before that date, 
And so once again, we get predictive value for diminished snowpack even early in the calendar year. Um, and that's where most of our um, snowmelt runoff prediction skill comes from, is looking months in advance of the snowmelt runoff season at the accumulation of snowpack. So if we look at climate change in the upper Rio Grande Basin, um, we can show that in this slide, um, which shows uh, observed annual average temperature and precipitation uh, in the Rio Grande headwaters, which turns out to be um, a climate division recognized by NOAA. So these are climate divisional averages of um, uh, cooperative w observer weather stations in the Rio Grande headwaters region. And what we see is that the temperature curve on the top has been going up with considerable interannual variability. But um, in fact, in these uh, glorious native units of degrees Fahrenheit and inches, uh, there's been about a three degree increase in recent decades, which actually turns out to be pretty similar to a mid-range climate change projection for the 20th century in terms of the rate of change. So really what climate uh, projections are telling us is that it's a reasonable expectation for um, a continuation of what we've already seen over the past 40 years or so to occur for the rest of the century. There's, there's nothing particularly extraordinary about the projected rate of increase. It's just a continuation of what we've already seen in this basin. On the other hand, the precipitation curve at the bottom shows um, uh, wet decades and dry decades, but there really is no observed uh, trend in the data in precipitation uh, in, in the upper Rio Grande. But then if we look at snowpack, we see a uh, curve that is more that's similar in character to uh, the temperature curve. So um, uh, Shailene Chavarria put together the curve in the upper right which is based on relatively low elevation snow course sites as opposed to snow tell sites, which are used more frequently these days. The advantage of the snow course data are that they go farther back in time. And so if we take an average of snow course sites shown by the yellow dots on the map to the left um, and average them together using a weighted average based on an eigen analysis, we get the curve on the, in the upper right, which actually shows that, again, with lots of interannual variability, that overall there's a 25% decrease over the period of record in April for snowpack um, if we just fit a straight line to those data. Uh, so that's a very significant decrease. Uh, again, with lots of interannual variability, the curves in the lower right uh, simply serve to try to convince us that the snow course data are reproducing interannual variability reasonably in more recent data compared to the snow tell sites. And as we would expect, the snow tell sites um, uh, given by the dashed lines show higher absolute values of snowpack because they're generally located at higher elevation. So. What we see in the climate record is over the past uh, half century or so is a rapid increase in temperature, a corresponding decrease in snowpack, and very little trend at all in total precipitation. So what we see as a result of all that is um, very little change over the period of record in the discharge at the Del Norte gauge. Um, so in the lower right, we see um, a, a, a time series of total volumetric flow, there actually is a very small decrease um, in that time series. It does not pass standard statistical significance tests. So um, in comparison to the rather dramatic decreases in stream flow that climate models project, what we do not see in the data even during a period of temperature increase and snowpack decrease is a corresponding big decrease in water year discharge. And that is one of the things we'd like to try to understand. However, if we parse the annual cycle, um, uh, parse the total flow into an annual cycle, we can um, look at the early decades and later decades of our period of record in the upper left. 
and we see hydrographs at the Del Norte gauge um, that show a, a change in the pattern, the monthly um, uh, delivery of stream flow past the gauge that looks qualitatively somewhat like um, the projected hydrograph changes coming out of climate models in the sense that we see a very large decrease in stream flow in the summer months of June and July. So if I just compare the absolute value of flow in June and July in the early and later years, I get a change that's shown in the lower left of these bar chart curves here. Um, I see a modest increase in the spring months of March and May, and it's that increase in the spring month flows that's um, uh, compensating for the large decrease in summer flows during this uh, period of time. So but if I compare the early decades and the late decades, what I see is a flattened hydrograph um, and increased variability. Um, so there is some similarity in what we might expect from um, climate change models simulating the effects of a warmer climate, um, but we don't see the absolute decrease in total flow, uh, at least not yet. Part of the answer here, I think, has to do with the decadal variability of precipitation. So if, if we say there's no long-term change in total precipitation, there are some changes that we see if we look more carefully at winter and early spring months, that's the green curve on this plot, versus the later months, which are the months after peak snow from April through July. And, and what we see is that um, uh, there is a lot of decadal variability in both of these curves. And the decadal variability, that is the general tendency for low precipitation values back in the 50s with several wet decades in the 80s and 90s, and then more recent drought years, looks the same in both curves, which is to say that those decadal fluctuations seem to be similar across the seasonal cycle. But on, a, on an individual yearly basis, there's no correlation between winter and spring precipitation. So what that tells us is that there may be some annual coherence to um, the decadal variability of precipitation, but on an annual basis, if we're trying to make a stream flow projection, then how much rain is falling into the system late in the spring and in the summer is totally uncorrelated with um, uh, winter precipitation associated with snowpack. And, and that helps us, that, that degrades the um, quality of an annual water supply outlook over this period of record. And to make matters worse, uh, from that perspective, if we actually look at the variability of these curves, the interannual variability of the orange curve, that's the um, spring precipitation, is increasing uh, by a lot, actually. In recent decades, it's up about 50% over what it was um, in the early decades of this period of record, and, and that, too, is going to make uh, annual water supply outlooks harder in this period of time when snowpack is decreasing. Okay, to try to put all this together, um, I find it useful to think simply. That's how my brain works. So here's how I think about the water cycle um, um, <clears throat> using this cartoon. And, and so if the, what we are, are thinking about is, is what determines the, the flow of water in this river past the red square uh, downstream here, and that's affected by a number of things. Um, if we start up at the top, we have snow which accumulates into snowpack, and that's the predictable part of all this because we can actually see the snowpack accumulate, and we can um, look at the effects of that snowpack on downstream flow using something like a runoff ratio, which is just the, the ratio of downstream flow divided by either precipitation or snowpack. In addition, we have uh, rainfall that falls into this system, both in the winter increasingly as temperatures warm up and later in the spring. 
and, and that rain is a source of uncertainty now, and that uncertainty is going to increase as the snow decreases and turns to rain. We may have some seasonal predictability of large-scale rain if we start incorporating um, seasonal precipitation forecasts into an annual water supply outlook, but we need to do an awful lot more work to, uh, to, to, to make that happen. And then finally, I haven't talked about this too much in this presentation, but there's convective rain that also falls in this system in the summer, for which we have essentially zero seasonal predictability and for which our long-term climate change projections also don't provide us with too much guidance. So if we want to understand how this system works with an eye toward long-term projections or year-to-year -year predictions, um, we need to think about snowpack as the signal and the snowpack is decreasing, and rainfall as the noise, and, and the relative importance of the rainfall has been increasing in recent decades relative to the snowpack. I can try to quantify that by looking at this set of runoff ratios that are calculated in several different ways. So there's a lot here, and I want to just kind of fly through the, the, the key parts. So if we look at these um, two scatter plots on the left, the x-axis here uh, is April 1st snowpack. Each dot represents a year, and the y-axis represents the April through July discharge at Del Norte. And what we see in the upper left is ab about the best possible case for making a seasonal forecast or for understanding um, how much water is going to flow down the river based on snowpack because the dots are provide a real close fit to that just uh, linear regression there. So if we know snowpack on April 1st in the upper left, then we, have a, we can make a very skillful estimate of how much water is going to flow down the river between April and July. Then what happened over the past few decades is the climate warmed up. So the first thing you see is that the right-hand part of this graph is chopped off because we no longer have those high snowpack years that we had in the early decades. Um, and the fit to this scatter plot is considerably worse in recent decades. So the R-squared value, that is, goes down by a lot uh, relative to the earlier years, which tells us that the simplest possible statistical forecast that we could make in which we predict April um, through July discharge based on April 1st snowpack um, is just going to be a lot worse. Um, there's another... Um, feature of this, uh, these two graphs, and that is that the, the slope of the line is shallower in the lower plot, which tells us that the sensitivity of runoff to, uh, in this case, April 1st snowpack is now less, and I would argue that is what we would expect to happen in a period of time when um, snowpack is decreased relative to the amount of rain, which remember is not exhibiting a, um, the total precip is not exhibiting an, any uh, downward decline. Um, and, and so the sensitivity the, of, of our um, forecasts is getting worse. Um, and I could make pretty much the same argument using a more traditional runoff ratio based on winter precipitation. So. Um, I would say that the effects of warmer temperatures exhibited by these runoff ratios is already being seen in our attempts to make year-to-year -year forecasts based on snowpack. So to wrap things up, um, I would I hope we've shown that um, climate in this region is changing in ways that really should affect surface water resources over the long term as climate models would project. So we see temperature going up and we see snowpack going down. However, we don't see significant long-term trends yet in precipitation or stream flow. Um, I think the reason for that is that over recent decades, the effects of springtime precipitation, um, which have been both higher and more variable than in recent decades, have been masking the effects of long-term changes in temperature and snowpack, but that's a working hypothesis for our ongoing research. 
So what we see in the data is that warmer temperatures have diminished the snowpack and precipitation other than snowpack has varied a lot, which has decreased both prediction skill and predictability. And I make a distinction between those two terms, but um, you can ask me about the distinction later. Um, we've, we've shown a complicated set of runoff ratios that show somewhat different things if I base them on snowpack or precipitation. And we're doing an awful lot of follow-up research right now to try to understand those scatter plots um, uh, more thoroughly than we do now and to incorporate the effects of temperature explicitly on them. And in order to understand how this hydrologic system works, we're going to have to distinguish snowpack itself from the spring and summer rainfall variability. In other words, we see the effects of long-term climate change and decadal climate variability all mixed up in ways that are going to be very uh, important to, to tease apart uh, if we want to increase our understanding of the system and increase our prediction skill on annual timescales. And I'll wrap up there. Thanks, Dave. Um, Danielle, if you'd go ahead and switch us back over to um, uh, Dave Clow. So um, let me introduce Dave Clow and his team. Dave Clow is a research hydrologist at the USGS in Denver, Colorado, where he began his career with the USGS in 1990. <clears throat> Dave has been working in the field of snow hydrology since 1984. On his team are also Colin Penn and Grand Sexton, both of whom serve as hydrologists there at the USGS office in Denver. Uh, Colin started as a seasonal hydrotech in 2010, and Graham's research focuses on seasonal snow hydrology and the importance of snow processes to water budgets, water availability, and water quality in the western U.S. So, David, take it away. Dave, are you on? Dave Clow? <laughs> Dave, if you're speaking, you're muted. We can't hear you. Dave, are you on? We can't hear you. Colin, are you on? Okay, Dave, we can see your screen, but we can't hear you. Can you hear me? This is Dave. Yes. We can hear you now. Okay, fabulous. Okay, um, so I'm going to start off our presentation with uh, kind of a just a simple overview of runoff, our water supply outlook um, forecasts, and and errors associated with those. Dave Gutzler gave a very nice presentation on the influence of climate variability and change on uh, snowpack and on stream flow. Our presentation is going to focus a little bit more on the effects of disturbance um, on 
snowpack and stream flow and water supply. Um, our project objectives are to identify potential sources of error in existing forecast models. Um, secondly, to improve our understanding of snowpack dynamics within the watershed, and Grant will talk about that. Um, and then also to develop a new hydrologic model for the basin to aid in forecasting, and Colin will um, present those results. Okay, the Rio Grande headwaters are shown here. Um, the pink box in the upper left of the map shows the, the study area. And here is a, a simple map showing the outline of the watershed in pink. Um, gauges run by the Colorado Department of Water Resources are shown in green. Um, and blue shows the, uh, some of the HRUs, the hydrologic response units. Here's a, just a, a map showing uh, land cover variability in the watershed. Uh, there's a lot of evergreen, or at least there used to be a lot of evergreen forest. I'll get to that more in a, more in a moment. Um, there's a lot of uh, terrain above tree line as well, so a lot of alpine zone. One of the questions we pose are how have land cover changes within the study area impacted runoff forecasting performance? And so what we're getting at there are, what are the effects of disturbance, especially, on uh, runoff forecast errors? Here's a, a simple plot showing the, uh, first of all, the seasonal accumulation of snowpack through the year, starting in October. That's the light blue line. And uh, generally, the peak sweet occurs sometime in April, and then the snow starts to melt. Um, and that's when stream flow starts to come up, and that's shown by the dark blue line. So the, the stream flow responds very directly to snow melt. Snow melt is the driving, driving hydrologic force in the watershed, at least in the upper part of the watershed. So um, the NRCS provides water supply outlooks uh, starting January 1, and then they do it again uh, on a monthly basis through the springtime. And that is indi those, uh, these arrows that are popping up show the timing of the water supply outlook forecasts. And you can see that um, the snow is continuing, continues to accumulate through the springtime. And as you might expect, um, it becomes a little bit easier. We have higher predictive skill in pre in the water supply outlook forecasts as we move through the springtime. So um, there's March and April. And um, this plot shows runoff errors by month. And it starts in 1990 and goes, goes through 2015. These are the NRCS water supply outlooks. And we're showing the percent error in the water supply outlooks for each year and by month. And the next slide, I'm going to zoom in on 2002 so you can see things a little more clearly. And um, what you can see is that the percent error, um, if we look at the column over on the uh, far left, you can see there's a lot of error in, our, in the water supply outlook forecast in January. Um, the error goes down in February and then again in March. And then there's April, May, and June. April 1st is typically, that's sort of the standard that, um, that is commonly used for making um, important decisions about water supply for the year. And this slide indicates how the, um, the, the errors change through the course of the springtime. So in January, there's a NASH, so the NASH Sutcliffe is a measure of model accuracy. And the NASH Sutcliffe index varies from uh, negative one to plus one. A number of, a value of one indicates perfect skill in predicting something. Uh, a value of zero pre represents no skill. And you can see in January, the NASH Sutcliffe for this um, group of years is about 0 0.31. So it, it, that 0.31 indicates very moderate skill in, in predicting water supply for the year. Nash Sutcliffe improves to 0.4 by April 1st, 
and then when we get to June, it's 0 0.74, but so that makes sense because by that time, most of the precip has already fallen during for the springtime, and so really we should have very good skill by the time that has happened. But in April, our Nash Sutcliffe cliff is really is is only 0 0.4, so it's it's not that high. This plot shows uh, variability in the water supply outlook errors um, from 1990 through 2014 based on April 1 uh, snow water equivalent. And this is for the Rio Grande above Del Norte, which is the same gauge that Dave Gutzler um, used in his study. Values that are above zero, this horizontal line represents zero, values that are above zero represent years where the predicted value value for water supply was greater than what actually happened. And um, the, the inverse is, uh, applies to values below the zero line. You can see there's a lot of variability in the error. Some years um, there was a, a large negative bias, and in other years, like 2002, the, uh, the forecast was way above what actually happened. Um, so then one of the next questions is what's controlling those, what's influencing those errors? Why is it so good some years and why is it so bad in other years? Well, bark beetles um, have really impacted forests in, in Colorado and this plot shows the timing of the mountain pine beetle and of the spruce beetle in Colorado forests. Um, and so the, the mountain pine beetle peaked in around the late 2000s. But the spruce beetle has continued to impact forests in Colorado, and uh, this plot indicates that it, it peaked in about 2004. Now in the, in the Rio Grande Basin, the upper Rio Grande, Grande um, this map shows areas that have been impacted by the spruce beetle um, in pink, and the intensity is indicated by the darkness of the pink color. Um, the plot on the bottom shows cumulative bark beetle uh, impacts starting in 1999 and going through 2015. And um, there was a rapid spread in the mid-2000s, uh, especially 2005 through about 2010 or 11. Um, it, the bark beetle impacted about 31% of the Rio Grande, Grande headwaters. So um, here we've overlaid the bark beetle cumulative um, impacts on top of the errors in the water supply outlooks. And as you can see, the bark beetle, the timing of the bark beetle impacts, we're not really seeing a big influence on the water supply outlook errors. What about fire? So there was a large fire in the watershed in 2013, the West Fork Papoose Fire, and uh, it burned 81,000 acres, um, some of it fairly intensely. If we add that uh, to our plot of the water supply errors, we can see that starting in 2013, when the fire happened, we the water supply outlooks started to, um, the predictions were less than what was observed. In other words, we were getting more stream flow than were than was predicted by the regression equations that the NRCS uses. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Graham, and he is going to talk about uh, snowpack dynamics and how disturbance might influence that. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, so you know, as a part of this study, um, we're looking at uh, snowpack processes and um, trying to see if we can use a combination of um, you know field-based observations as well as modeling uh, techniques to potentially improve snow estimates um, for the basin. So as a part of the, our field-based activities, we installed um, three enhanced uh, meteorological stations within the basin to collect some auxiliary data 
um, things like relative humidity and wind speed and radiation, things, variables that are really important for snow evolution but aren't traditionally collected at things like snow tell stations. Um, in addition to these uh, meteorological stations, we've uh, collected a, a variety of uh, manual field-based uh, observations of the snowpack. Um, and particularly over the past few years is, is when we've been collecting this, this manual um, data. And so really we've kind of been collecting this information as a way to try to aid in our modeling effort. Um, so we've developed a, a spatially distributed snow model um, for the upper Rio Grande Basin. Um, and, you know, with the ultimate goal of, you know, can we, can this distributed model give us a better idea of um, snow, spatially distributed snow estimates for the basin? Um, and more specifically, uh, we have kind of a few more targeted questions such as, you know, how representative are the snow tell stations of basin-wide snow accumulation and snow water resources? And this is kind of a... It's, a, it's been a big question for a long time. It's, you know, how, how should we be relying on these um, point measurements um, to represent snow across the entire basin area? Um, this plot on the bottom highlights a few of our manual snow surveys that we collected um, around three different snow tell gauges in the basin. And so the, um, the blue snow tell um, Snow water equivalent is shown for two different years, and it's compared to the historic average in red. So these these uh, water year 2016 and water year 2017 were uh, fairly close to average years compared to the historic average. Um, but the blue squares on these plots actually represent the average of our manual measurements that were collected. Uh, pretty much in, you know, a, a couple square kilometers around these stations. So this is, you know, pretty focused um, specifically around these gauges, and we can see there's some pretty big discrepancies where, you know, the, the snow we're measuring around the gauges, mostly within forested areas, is considerably less than, you know, what this snow tell, snow pillow is showing. Um, so, you know, in, in addition to um, trying to understand you know, how representative these, these snow tell stations are. We're really, you know, trying to see can this uh, spatially distributed snow model be used to aid in runoff forecasting. So to give a, a real quick overview of the snow model that we've developed, um, it's called snow model. It's a, it's a spatially distributed process-based snow evolution model. So um, this little figure down here kind of is a, is a nice representat representation of um, physically based snow models. So essentially they're run on a grid um, and you can sort of specify, you know, how fine or coarse resolution this grid is, but um, it uses a combination of elevation, uh, land cover, and then meteorological forcing data. Um, and for every grid in your domain, it essentially calculates the energy balance throughout the season. Um, and this snow model is particularly important because it represents processes that are important in alpine environments such as blowing snow and also in forested environments such as canopy interception and canopy sublimation. Um, and these things are really important, especially if we're, we're wanting to consider how forest disturbances, which are very widespread in this basin, uh, may be influencing snowpack dynamics. So this is a, um, a few graphs just highlighting some of the model output um, for some of our preliminary uh, snow modeling we've done. And really kind of just this is um, basically biweekly plots um, throughout the snowmelt season. So this first plot in the top left represents April 1st, and then it goes all the way through July 15th. And so we have three different variables here. This um, plot on the far left is cumulative precipitation. Uh, the plot in the middle is snow water equivalent, and then the plot on the right represents runoff to the land surface. So that's, you know, the combination of snow melt and or rain uh, precipitation land falling onto the land surface. 
So we can see that there's a lot of variability that sort of jumps out um, in all three of these variables. And also, um, you know, most of these forecasts are based on this April 1st date. And you see how, you know, spring precipitation, in particular in this year, uh, was pretty important because we, we start to see, you know, especially in this area near Wolf Creek Pass, starts to get a lot of spring precipitation, which can really, and it, it's hard to see this graph here, but it does translate into pretty big increases in snow water equivalent at these higher elevations, and especially at the elevations that are above snow tell gauges and, and aren't always picked up by, you know, what a snow tell is measuring. So this is just generally highlighting, you know, a lot of the variability that we're trying to consider uh, with this spatially explicit model. Um, and so these plots represent um, essentially a comparison between what snow t the average snow tell gauge is showing compared to, you know, what our average of the, our modeled average for the entire Rio Grande headwaters is. Um, so the red line on these graphs represents the modeled value that's averaged across the basin, and the dark blue dashed line represents the average of these five, five different snow tail gauges that are um, in the headwaters. So you can see this cumulative precipitation, um, our average model precipitation is actually fairly close um, across, spatially compared to the average of these um, snow tail precipitation measurements. But when we look at snow water equivalent, we see a pretty huge discrepancy. Um, and, you know, we would expect that because these, these snow tail stations are located in these high elevation locations, really kind of set up as index sites um, that are meant to hold snow um, for a long time. But it's kind of important to note just sort of how the, the magnitude difference um, is pretty large, but also when we look at this snow melt season, the rate of melt is quite different when we look at a snow tail average melt rate versus a basin wide average melt rate, where we have this tail that sort of, you know, we end up eventually having more snow um, later in the spring than that snow tail average. And those are all things that, um, you know, may be important to consider for a more accurate stream flow forecast. Um, and certainly, you know, Stream flow forecasts aren't based on a water balance estimate. They're based on these linear correlations of, of snow tell and stream flow. So really we're, you know, one of the things we want to look at is how has this relation between the average snow tell snow measurements compared to the basin wide snow tell or basin wide modeled snow, how has that changed over time? And are there significant trends that we're finding uh, in that relation. Uh, lastly, we see this is the, in red, we have the modeled cumulative runoff to the land surface um, from snow model, and that's compared to cumulative stream flow at the, measured at the Del Norte gauge. Um, you see these you know, are pretty highly correlated, um, mm -hmm. but also there's a pretty large discrepancy between these, these two, and that has a lot to do with other hydrologic processes like evapotranspiration and change in storage that are really important to consider uh, when making these forecasts. So, you know, we're still kind of in the, in the middle of this project and uh, work is still ongoing. So kind of our next steps are to, to try to explicitly model these changes um, in forests, uh, forest disturbances specifically by uh, adjusting the leaf area index uh, that the model uses through time based on measurements from satellite data. Um, and then really trying to, to key in on, you know, what are the changes between uh, snow tail observations and model basin snow water resources over time. Um, lastly, the, you know, one of the main goals of the, the snow modeling we're doing is to try to uh, aid the hydrologic model that we're developing for this project uh, through calibra calibration and also representation of, of snow processes. So I'm going to pass it over to Colin Penn, and he's going to talk about some of the hydrologic modeling. All right, thanks, Graham. Uh, so the USGS has a surface water model called the Precipitation Runoff Modeling System. Uh, they've developed a national hydrologic model, which is across the conterminous U.S. and parts of Alaska.
where they've um, kind of pre-processed a lot of these basin parameter sets, parameter sets by HRU, and uh, you can pull out specific areas of the model. So for this, focusing in on the Rio Grande headwaters, um, we have the Rio Grande headwaters PRMS model, which is made up of 28 hydrologic response units. These are shown in pink. And these are based on points of interest within the basin, such as gauges, like the Del Norte gauge, major confluences, and then also elevation. So you see some higher elevation HRUs um, in the uh, high elevation regions of the model. Uh, the model, as part of this national hydrologic model, is regionally calibrated. But as you can imagine, regionally calibrating for the whole Rio Grande uh, might miss some of the you know, measurement marks that we'd want to hit in the headwater areas. So using the uh, National Hydrologic Model pull as a baseline, we did a further calibration using the DayMet forcing product uh, from 1980 to 2015. And that kind of incorporates some of those climatic changes that the uh, previous presentation highlighted. Uh, we used the program LUCA to calibrate by basin and subbasin for a 10-year period, focusing on these processes of runoff, snow melt, soil moisture, and, and uh, evapotranspiration, which were identified as some of the more sensitive processes in the basin. And uh, you can see some of the fit parameters following that calibration. And then a baseline run using PRMS was run from 1990 to 2015, kind of this uh, the uh, forecast region or area that we're focusing on for the period of record. And so some of the results from PRMS and compared to the water supply outlooks, overall, annually, you can see that the model um, has a pretty good fit to gauged observations, uh, fairly high Nash Sutcliffe and volumetric efficiency uh, metric. <laughs> Bless you. When we compare this to the um, to the water supply outlooks, you can see that the range of PRMS simulated flow is much more constrained than the water supply outlook. So when you compare maybe the whole period of record, the overall bias is similar magnitude, but you can see this high, high and low in the water supply outlook is constrained much to a much more smaller range in the PRMS uh, simulated flows. And uh, this is kind of highlighting that forcing data is incorporating those climatic changes in this is a minimum and maximum temperature from that day met forcing product. You can also see that the PRMS model is much more consistent in its bias, so a, a, a consistent over prediction up until about 2006 when it switched to this under prediction period. And uh, that may or may not be related to uh, the bark beetle epidemic in that area. And so to incorporate bark beetle into PRMS, we manipulated the uh, vegetation parameters, specifically the summer and winter cover density, and then those in turn are those in turn impact the uh, radiation transmission to the canopy and the snow and rain interception parameters within PRMS. And so we used the cumulative mortality uh, time series from the Forest Service that David showed earlier in the presentation to modify the cover density within each HRU, and then use that modified cover density to um, calculate a new radiation inter and intercept parameter for PRMS by each HRU. And uh, some of the new features of PRMS include a dynamic parameter scheme, which allows you to change these through time without having to stop and restart your modeling scheme. So the big question is how much did this bark beetle impact uh, runoff within the basin from a modeling standpoint? Well, you can see in, this, uh, in the simulated and observed flow plot in the top, that there's not a huge difference between the baseline simulation and the bark beetle simulation. And this is actually kind of expected. Previous literature has shown that um, the difference in, at a basin scale, the difference in flow is about 10% more in bark beetle impacted area compared to uh, sort of unimpacted or unaffected areas, um, either from a numerical modeling standpoint or from a comparison to historic and current flows. Uh, there's several studies that have looked into that. And then when you look at the impact on the percent bias, you can see that reflected in years where the baseline model was uh, over-predicting that increased flow bumped that bias up by a measurable amount. And then in the areas where the model was, was uh, systematically under-predicting, you can see that increased flow actually increased 
uh, or reduce the bias in the bark beetle impact model. But overall, not a huge difference uh, attributed to the bark beetle. And so the next thing we're looking at is the fire impacts. You can see at the those last three years, the 2013 fire, both the water supply outlook and PRMS models show a systematic under prediction in flow through that period. Another thing to point out is there's these years where overall the water supply outlook and bias in the PRMS model are pretty consistent in their, at least in the direction of their bias, but there's these uh, several years where they deviate and so we're sort of starting to look into that and what reasons or what uh, factors might be causing that deviation. And so our next steps with this project, like Graham mentioned, we're uh, kind of in the middle of it right now. Our next step is to incorporate these fire effects into PRMS and compute and compare them to baseline results and the water supply outlooks. Uh, then compare the PRMS and snow model, snow output, and see if we can improve the snow scheme in PRMS to better represent snow throughout the whole basin. And then use our, our physical models and the water supply outlooks to see if there's a, uh, like Graham mentioned, a um, relationship that changes through time between snow tail and basin-wide snow water equivalent, and then see if we can improve that snow run, the snow and runoff ratio for future water supply forecasts based on any observations that we see. And finally, in addition to uh, the uh, climatic effects that the previous presentation highlighted, we're look, going to look at uh, some sort of other factors that may be affecting snow melt in the area, such as dust on snow and other things like that. So that's the end of our presentation. I guess we'll pass it back to Mike and uh, we'll open, up, open it up for questions. Hey, great presentation, guys. This is John Bumgarner from the New Mexico Water Science Center. Um, for your model calibration, did you guys do a calibration for the entire study period, or did you do a calibration for pre and post bark beetle infestation? Uh, the calibration was from 1980 to 1990, so pre-beetle. Pre-beetle, okay, thanks. This is Tim Kirkpatrick with New Mexico Prescribed Fire Council. Um, I was wondering if you had done a correlation with uh, wind direction and prevailing temperature during that time. I had to live in the range that uh, broadcast was just I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Uh, have you done a correlation for uh, prevailing wind and wind temperature? Um, I seem to recall that during some of these periods where you show a discrepancy, we had uh, an unusual shift of warm winds out of the southwest compared to what would be a consistent normal uh, of wind out of the northwest. Yeah. No, we haven't looked into that, um, but that's, you know, really great advice on, you know, we, we're definitely, you know, wanting to take it further and, and try to dig into, you know, specifics in these years and, and what, you know, climatic factors um, or other factors may have been you know, influencing these errors. So, um, we, yeah, we appreciate that advice. Yeah. 
Uh, Hi, everyone. <coughs> Mike, are you there? Did you want to close up, or did anybody have any other questions? I have one question uh, on the first uh, presentation. Okay. Um, I want the graph that shows the temperature trend. Can you repeat that, please? Can you bring the graph so that I can see the temperature trend in the first presentation? sharing. I believe it did that because it's five already. Let me see. Are you still, you're not able to share the presentation anymore? Mike, are you there? Anyway, I think my question was uh, the temperature uh, trend is increasing uh, starting from 97.3 uh, up to present. But if we go back uh, before uh, 97.3, it's also increased the same kind of trend that we have. Uh, so I don't know how can we say that uh, there is uh, a temperature increase, three degrees centigrade, something like that, uh, on the graph. So we have uh, to include that in uh, both before 1973 and after 1973. Did anybody hear that? And who are you directing your question towards? To the first presenter. To David, David Getzler? Yeah. Dave, are you still there? David's not, either he, he's unmuted or he can't hear us. What, it, what I can do is I can take your question down and I can go ahead and email him and make sure you get a response. Okay. I have so also you, another question uh, for the last presentation. Okay. Uh, so when you really uh, use the hydrologic model uh, for land use uh, for the forest, uh, did you consider uh, different types of forest like deciduous forest, mixed forest, or evergreen forest in your uh, model? Yeah. You know what would be oh. Go ahead. Uh, the PRMS model kind of has three, or sorry, four different um, land cover schemes, and so the dominant one is what makes up the uh, sort of cover type for each HRU. And so there is an evergreen HRU type, and then there is a mixed forest HRU, or sorry, uh, vegetation type that you can specify for each HRU. And so it is differentiated between the two. So you have like evergreen, mixed, and deciduous forest, or just only evergreen and situation, no mixed. Uh, mixed. No no mixed, just evergreen or deciduous, but you can set the uh, 
you can set the transpiration beginning and end period. And so for an evergreen forest, you can set a deciduous scheme and then the cover density won't decrease significantly between the summer and winter months. And so you're essentially representing an evergreen forest with uh, a mixed forest scheme. Thanks. Yep. Okay, are those all our questions? Okay, everyone, it looks like I don't see Mike anymore. So we can go ahead and wrap this up since it's already after five. So thank you so much to the presenters. And if no one has anything else to say, we can go ahead and close this up. Thanks everybody for attending. Thank you everybody. <laughs>